From these arguments, one rationally concludes that the body, far from being a non-personal or sub-personal instrument at the direction and disposal of the conscious and desiring self, is irreducibly part of the personal reality of the human being. It is properly understood, therefore, as fully sharing in the dignity, the intrinsic worth of the person, and deserving the respect due to persons precisely as such. A comatose human being is not uh, uh, the shell of a person, the person having gone, having left the shell, leaving a, a shell behind the way an oyster leaves a shell behind. A comatose human being is a person in a coma. The early embryo is a human being, and precisely as such, a person, the same person who will soon crawl and then walk, and then in a few short years be asking mom and dad for the car keys. It's the same living member of the species Homo sapiens, that same creature at a different stage of development. The genetically complete, distinct, dynamically unified, self-integrating organism that we currently identify as the, say, 39-year-old or so Bishop Salvatore Cordelione <laughs> is the same complete, distinct, dynamically unified, self-integrating organism the same living member of the species Homo sapiens, the same human being, the same person who was once a 24-year-old seminarian, and before that, no doubt, a precocious 16-year-old high school student, before that, a mischievous adolescent, and before that, a toddler, an infant, a fetus, and an embryo. Same guy, same living member of the species. Although he has grown and changed in many ways, no change of nature or substance, nothing changing from one kind of thing into another, from a cow into a human being, or a fish into a human being, or a rock into a human being. No change of fundamental nature occurred as he matured, and he did mature with his completeness, distinctness, unity, and identity fully intact from the embryonic through the fetal infant child and adolescent stages of his development, he finally emerged into adulthood. At no point was he somebody different or something different. Those differences, those stages are just that, stages in the development of a unified, determinate individual organism, a human being. He was a human being from the start. He did not become a human being sometime after he came to be, nor will he or any of the rest of us cease to be human beings prior to our ceasing to be by dying. In view of these facts, it's evident that the central ground of the secularist defense of abortion, infanticide, suicide, and euthanasia is decisively undercut. And it's undercut not by appeal to revelation, did you notice? At no point did I invoke Scripture, though I think there's scriptural support for uh, the pro-life claim, as important as revealed truth is to the life of faith. No. We understand that human beings have dignity and worth, and if they have it, they have it at every stage and not just at some. And if they have it, they don't lose it, except by dying and ceasing to be. We understand that by engagement directly with the best arguments that orthodox secularists make on the very plane in which they make them, the plane of common human reason. Much the same is true in the area of sexual morality. Orthodox secularists would have us believe that marriage is a social and legal convention that in a variety of possible ways, ways serves a purely emotional bond between two or more persons, a romantic connection. They believe that apart from revealed religious doctrine, which other people may, in the exercise of their own religious freedom, happen not to share, no one has reasons for believing marriage to be anything more. I mean, this, this really was the central claim on which Judge Vaughn Walker uh, made his decision in the Prop 8 case. I mean, it's just, just that. But it's not true. Marriage is what some philosophers call a basic human good, that is, an, a more than merely instrumental reason for acting, a basic fundamental aspect of the flourishing of human beings. By that I mean it's an intrinsic good, something that provides a more than merely instrumental reason for something that we do, namely enter into a marriage. Reasons which are knowable and understandable even apart from divine revelation. Rational reflection on marriage as it is participated in by men and women 
makes it clear, since men and women are essentially embodied and not simply inhabitants of a suit of flesh, since the dualistic position is false, the biological union of spouses in generative acts, sexual congress, quite irrespective of whether the non-behavioral conditions of procreation happen to obtain, consummates and actualizes their marriage, making the spouses truly and not merely metaphorically two in one flesh. Some people read uh, what it says in uh, Genesis 2, if I remember the scripture correctly, uh, Bishop Corleone. Some people read that passage that says, and a man shall leave his mother and the woman leave her home and the two shall become one flesh, as if it was a metaphor. But notice that the Bible doesn't say, it's like they're so close, they're so connected, they're so emotionally bonded, that it's like they were one flesh. A lot of people, including a lot of Christians, have interpreted it in that metaphorical way. Now, I'm generally sort of not in favor of biblical literalism, but this time the Bible's catching on to a big truth, one that you don't need the Bible to affirm, but the Bible's got it right up there in front. It's not metaphorical. The two quite literally become one in the act of generation. I'll explain why. The sexual union of spouses, far from being something extrinsic to marriage or merely instrumental to procreation, pleasure, the expression of tender feelings, or anything else, is an essential aspect of marriage as an intrinsic human good. Marital acts are the biological matrix of the multi-level, that is bodily, emotional, dispositional, rational, spiritual, sharing of life and commitment that marriage is. Because human beings aren't just emotional centers or consciousnesses inhabiting bodies. The complete sharing of life that marriage is, is a sharing of life at every level. Not just the emotion, the dispositional, the rational, the spiritual, and the bodily. And according to Jewish and Christian tradition, and I think the broader religious traditions, that bodily union is at the very foundation. It's the matrix of the multi-level sharing of life. This is what makes sense out of what would otherwise be inexplicable about our legal history of marriage, and that is the laws about marital consummation. Those laws were put into place centuries ago, and, but, and there was no issue about homosexuality or whether same-sex persons could be married. It, that just wasn't on the table then, folks. But the law had to consider what finalizes or completes or perfects a marriage, and whether a marriage can be annulled or dissolved in its absence. And the law consistently and without dissent says consummation. The performance by the spouses of an act of the sort that causes procreation, whether or not it does cause procreation. You couldn't get out of a marriage simply by proving that your spouse was infertile. Infertility was no impediment to marriage. It's because marriage isn't purely instrumental to having children. But you could get out of a marriage if you could show it wasn't consummated. This is a lot about what Henry VIII's first marriage was about. The legal dispute was really about whether Catherine had consummated her marriage to Henry's older brother, who was king at the time, and then, and then died. You can make no sense out of this unless you understand the way in which sexual congress unites husband and wife in a very fundamental bodily way. Marriage is the form of intrinsically fulfilling communion that is what it is because it is a sharing of life that would be naturally fulfilled by the coming to be and the nurturing, the creating, the nurturing of new lives. And that relationship oriented to the coming to be of children that no one would have thought up except for the fact that people reproduce sexually, right? Have you ever thought about that? Would anybody ever have thought of marriage, thought up the idea if human beings reproduced asexually? You know, if you could do it yourself? No, right? So, but what the law clearly, and you know, it's established at a time when there were no issues about other kinds of sexual conduct. The, the, the law comes down very firmly two ways. Infertility, no impediment, non-consummation, you get out of the marriage. 
because it hasn't been completed, it hasn't been perfected. That while marriage is oriented toward the coming to be of children and has its shape and its norms are shaped by the fact that it is the uniquely apt institution for a relationship for nurturing children, its intrinsic value is sustained as a comprehensive multi-level sharing of life, the human being not being a non-bodily substance and the body being part of the personal reality of the human being. It, share, it, it, it maintains its intrinsic value even if the non-behavioral conditions of procreation do not obtain. 